Primarily the advice that I always give people is twofold. One is you need to be doing this because you love it because it's always hard to make it, but it's even harder now with just how many channels there are out there. And if you really are wanting to do this for real, it can't be because you want to be successful. It needs to be because it's in your blood and it's what you have to do. Otherwise, it'll never work for you. The other side is that sometimes when you're starting out, you shouldn't be necessarily making the thing that you is your biggest passion project because that you might not have the audience ready for some big, huge budget thing that you're going to spend all your money on and no one's going to watch. And it's better to figure out a format that's easier to produce. You can replicate on a consistent basis, build that audience up that then is a fan of yours, and then be able to bring that passion project in when they're ready for it. Wow, that's good advice. Behind the Brand features the people who are making things happen. Get insights to grow your business from the experts who've done it. Get Behind the Brand, sponsored by DocuSign, the global standard for e-signature. Get your free trial at DocuSign.com forward slash Behind the Brand. I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with Liam and Kathleen, who run YouTube Space LA and all the production that's happening here. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Us. Tell us a little bit about YouTube Space LA and what's going on here. It's amazing. YouTube Space LA is a place where YouTubers who are building their channels on the platform can come to learn how to make better videos. You know, we have production equipment, studios, stages. Um, cameras, lights, everything, but also how to build their audience on the platform and collaborate together. So you handle all the production? Yes. What is that like day to day? Day to day it's uh, talking to a lot of people about what they want to accomplish and then I have a team of producers that I manage that help those partners decide, okay, what studio do I need, what camera, what do I, what can I do to make this video, video better? Um, how can it get more views and what kind of collaborations can they do here? Liam, I want to ask you too. So you sort of manage at 30,000 feet. You're taking care of the entire facility. Talk to us about um, why YouTube created this space in the, be in the beginning. I mean, it's kind of a very unique property, right? You don't see a lot of YouTube employees here. It really, you see collabor collaborators and creators and partners, and they're just doing their own thing, right? Right. We were looking at uh, LA as a place where increasingly it was a center of gravity for YouTube. Yeah. And, and why is that? Well, it, it, you might have thought that LA is one of the most creative cities in the world. It's got a long and storied history. And you might have thought that YouTubers would have started here. Uh, but that wasn't necessarily true. YouTube happens everywhere. Yeah. But increasingly what's happened is people see this as a creative mecca and um, it's a place where there's a center of gravity for YouTubers to interact with each other. It's true. I mean, we were just talking to I Justine not too long ago and she's a Pittsburgh native and moved out here to Santa Monica, I think, and that's one of the early folks on YouTube, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So early on, Kathleen actually was, we, we were thinking about LA and Kathleen was asking creators uh, what it would take for them to be more ambitious with their content. And one of the first things that we heard back was, in LA, it, in the mode of production is sound stages. And sound stages are expensive for someone who's an entrepreneur starting their own channel. Yeah. If you could help us with that, that would be a great start. And that's sort of where the idea germinated. How did you reach out to some of these creators and talk about maybe some of the folks identify who, who were talking about um, that you talk to to kind of get feedback? In the development of the space? Yeah. Felicia Day, for sure. Yeah. Freddie W., uh, the Fine Brothers. Um, basically, a par partners that were starting to make a living on the platform and were on that cusp. And I went to them and I asked, you know, what do we need to build to make it easier for you to make this your job and more yeah. than your job, a business? You know, they're mini media companies yeah. and what do they need to make that happen and Felicia was the first person who said soundstage and then I talked to Benny and Rafi the Fine Brothers and I talked to Freddie uh, and then I also talked to some of the smaller creators who may not be looking at a soundstage uh, Grace Randolph who has a channel called Beyond the Trailer I talked to her um, at the time I was working on Next Up which is an initi initiative that the Next Lab ran 
uh, around kind of up and coming partners. And so we did a, a big boot camp with them for a week and mm -hmm. ran a filmmaking boot camp. And just watching them produce and kind of the challenges they were faced with and the things that amazed them. You know, we had a small green screen in our office in New York um, on 21st Street and they didn't even understand. They were just amazed that they could have a quiet room. Yeah. <laughs> with a camera and some lights. Wait, what? <laughs> you know, yeah. Like... Um, so just seeing the kind of range, talking to a range of partners to really see kind of what their needs were. I've seen several interviews with Freddie W. And uh, he always talks about how impossible it is to shoot around L.A. You can't get permits to begin with. So you have to kind of bogart the space. And then when you're there, you get kicked out from one place to the other. And that's the life of a, of a YouTube partner, right? I mean, yeah. that's... The other thing we noticed at, around that green screen was partners would run into each other. And just having that place, that neutral ground where they could find each other, you know, collaboration obviously amongst creative people tends to generate you know, more ideas, better ideas. And yeah. that was part of the magic of that small studio space that was part of the inspiration for this space. I think that's an excellent point and really subtle if you're watching, maybe we can underscore that collaboration. Let's talk about that and unpack it a little bit more. How important collaboration is and has become to the success of a channel that you've created? It's huge. I mean, it's one of the biggest ways you can build an audience on YouTube. I think, um, you know, audience isn't a zero sum game on YouTube. There's thousands, millions of channels yes. and infinite audience. And so one of the ways you can find audience in all the little pockets is by collaborating with another partner, you know, promoting each other, doing something cool. But it also pushes you creatively to do something a little different, to um, think about how you produce your video differently and learn from each other. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of bigger benefit. There is that like very direct benefit of driving traffic between two channels, just the way that you link between blogs mm -hmm. and you have a blog roll. This is like the YouTube equivalent of a blog roll. But the bigger benefit is the creative collaboration. You know, learning, oh, I didn't think about it that way. Oh, I've never made my thumbnails that way. Or, yeah. oh, you can shoot that with an iPhone. And, oh, you learned how to edit that way. Um, that, to me, is the most interesting and exciting thing to watch. So this is a lot like, you know, band camp for YouTube creators. It's, it's the video camp or, or an, an incubator. incubator. Yeah. 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 yeah it, when you walk in, it feels very nurturing. It feels very collaborative. The space is open, I think, by design. But then you have all these little private cubby spaces. So who, who can come here? How do you qualify? I know it's listed you know, somewhere on the YouTube back pages, and it spells it out, you know, what the threshold is. But talk to us maybe in less technical terms, like what you're looking for. So we have kind of multiple points of access for the space. There's events and workshops that are open to everyone. You know, you can come here, you can learn. Um, more about the playbook. You can learn more about how Freddie W. raised money with Kickstarter. We do regular events and panels. People can come do that to those, obviously. And where do they find it? Where, where do you uh, direct them? YouTube.com slash space. Okay. So that's our website. Um, and they can find all the information there about the workshops. Additionally, we run a program that we call the lab. You know, we have a comedy lab, a beauty lab. We do labs around um, key verticals and content. And right now we have our comedy lab here. It's 23 YouTube partners who they commit to working out of the space for a month to six weeks, producing a certain number of videos. Once they've produced those number of videos, and, and we require a number of those videos be collaborations to encourage people to really work together and, and find camaraderie among those, cha those channels. Once they've completed those videos, they get access to the space for a year. So it's contractual. Uh, are you funding it, or are you saying we give uh, them the space and the equipment? Our composition is traded for the space, yeah. And they get some crew support depending on the day they shoot. Yeah, um, it's outstanding. And they can sign up for the crew support. And we look at the channels. We look for the labs are channels that are you know building an audience. They've shown a commitment to the platform. They have a good amount of subscribers, not an absurd, like not millions of subscribers, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Yeah. And they want to take their their channel to the next level. They so they're at the tipping it. point, maybe. They just need a little nudge exactly. over the edge, yeah. Exactly. And okay. it's it's also, we look for people we think are creative and exciting. And, we, and also, we look at the kind of whole group and how they're going to get along. You know, we're in the yeah. comedy lab right now. The beauty lab is next month. And then we have a geek lab. And we kind of rotate through different verticals. Have you had any problems up to now with some conflicting personalities or? Not really. I mean, yeah. I think 
generally YouTubers are pretty fun and easygoing. Yeah. Although it can be a little bit like high school sometimes, you know, where there's personalities, big personalities and yeah. egos. and. But I think in what Liam was talking about with the neutral space yeah. is a really important thing. I think when you're in the, the YouTube space LA, there is this, well, I'm here. This is the central hub. It is YouTube. It is an incubator. You're going to behave a little more professionally. Yeah. You're going to treat each other with a little more respect because that's the kind of partner we're looking for and they yeah. know that it is, it's a special, it's a, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, and it's a privilege to have them here. I think that attitude permeates the entire process. And I think that's super healthy. And I think in general, you know, YouTube is a platform and you're, you know, you have open arms inviting people to come create content and you're providing, you know, it's, it's, all the, all the accoutrements, right? <laughs> like, you know, it's like this hosted party. Come bring your party to us. So I love that sort of interdependency. You need each other. You've got the bandwidth. You've got the facilities. You've got the know-how, the expertise. They bring the content, the magic, the creativity. It's a good marriage. I also think we learn a lot from the creators Absolutely. themselves. Yeah. yeah. You, know, every, you know, and this is everyone from you know, a small beauty channel to Freddie W. We've learned with every creator we work with, we learn something new about our facility and, and the platform. And that's partly by design also. So we have these different programs. In addition to the open programs Kathleen described in the labs that we do, we also have residencies. So when Freddie was here, he was shooting, I think, six episodes of the second season of his series video game, High School. The Fine Brothers are here now, and they're shooting 30 episodes of their the second season of My Music. So those are accomplished creators that yeah. are real leaders on the platform. And the benefit of having them here is that they commit to spending time with the other groups that are in the space. It's like a tutelage, right? They're they're mentoring other folks, yeah. That's right. So we like to say that the facility is available to creators at all levels, and it's important to note that it's free. Yeah. yeah. So it's not about social proof as much as it is about how they're doing the show of progress, um, their investment in the space, yeah. maybe some, you know, maybe they're a diamond in the rough. Maybe they don't have a gazillion subs or views yet, but they're... They're committed to the platform. I think yeah. that's the thing that is really important to us. They've yeah. shown, you know, they really want to build an audience. They're gaining traction. They're building subscribers. They're regularly posting. Um, and then there's a, there's a commitment to the community here. You know, and I think we ask for this for everyone who comes here. We ask it even the ones that come to our events, you know, and, and of our residents, you know, to really commit to collaboration, learning, treating each other well, and being excited to be here. And, I've been, um, I think Liam and I both have been very impressed with how excited even our residents. You'd think, you know, oh, they're big and famous now and they have a big channel, they're going to be snobs, but they're not. Freddie wanted people to walk in and watch his set, be on his set while he was shooting. He wanted them to be extras. He wanted them to go, he took um, some of the partners in our first class, he took to dinner. They all went to dinner together and he did three dinners with them. Uh, the Fine Brothers are equally enthusiastic about giving back to the community, mentoring, and really being here while they're here. That's cool. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, how Hollywood is now discovering YouTube, and let's talk about you know, c some of the, the land grab that I feel is happening right now between major studios, agencies who are trying to scoop up what I call super tubers or some of the YouTube elite, and uh, MCNs, multi-channel networks. Super tubers. That's the first time I've heard I've that heard one. That. You've coined a phrase. Thank you. I'll take it. <laughs> TM. <laughs> um, well, any thoughts on the land grab? Uh, what do you see happening in the space? And um, talk a little bit about how Hollywood is beginning to discover the platform and how maybe you're inviting Hollywood uh, to come in here and, and do their thing. I would say... Um, the great thing about, one of the great things about YouTube is it's an audience that you don't necessarily find elsewhere. And I think that um, there's more of an appreciation at all levels of media of that as time um, moves forward. One of the reasons we chose LA as a place for this facility, it's really the first facility Google's ever built that is not for people who work at Google. It belongs to the partners that are downstairs. Yeah. And part of the reason was because YouTubers were coming here 
But the reason for that, I believe, is that there is so much talent here already. I was going to say free food, but no. <laughs> that helps. It absolutely helps. But um, that's Google tradition. But, uh, but L.A. is a place where there are lots of people in various stages on projects at different times. Yeah, some of them happening. are fully employed. Some of them are not. And they're yeah. looking to start something, right? Um, so the one aspiration we had for the facility and it's being realized is that you've got not only YouTubers of various sizes who are coming in across all different uh, content domains, but you also have people from big media companies, um, traditional media companies that see this as neutral ground where they can come and bring the skills they may have. Maybe I'm a director and I've directed a feature film, but I am uncomfortable with web video. Yeah, I can come and interact with someone who may not know what a DP is, yeah. but is a savant in terms of growing subscri a subscriber base on YouTube. And yeah. um, we see Hollywood, the, the, the traditional Hollywood elite finding a place here and value here as well, which is great. Yeah. We did a, a shoot with Matt Damon and a bunch of YouTubers in water.org. Mm -hmm. So Matt Damon is um, one of the founders of water.org, is very passionate about um, water issues globally, and so he, he's on a fast strike right too, isn't he? Like, he's he he is uh, a strike a strike on yeah. toilets, and <laughs> this was this part of this campaign to raise awareness about how you know more people have mobile phones than access to clean water. Yeah, um, and so he came to us and said, or Water Door came to us and said they wanted to shoot a bunch of videos with YouTubers, and they wanted to use the space. Cool. And it was a really great example of the kind of collaboration, not only because it was between Matt Damon and a YouTuber, but just between two creative people, two creative groups coming together to make something together. Yeah. And everyone benefited. All the partners had the Matt Damon videos on their channels. Water.org had some really funny videos. And, and so they had a really great experience. What do you say to some of the Hollywood snobs that still say, I don't want to put my premium content next to content that's not premium on YouTube as a platform in general. How are you, are you doing anything to address that hurdle? Because it exists, I mean, let's talk about it, right? There's, you know, the people who would argue, I don't need YouTube as a platform. I've got people coming to see my movies and, you know, it's $500 million box office, blah, blah, blah. Um, how do you address that? I mean, I think one way that we address it is just by showing them more and more examples of their peers yeah. who are making leaps and bounds and accessing this audience that they couldn't access before yeah. and making content that was not necessarily shareable, yeah. um, making it uh, f fly, I guess, in, in this inherently social media platform. That's it, isn't it? I mean, it's this, it's opening the door to two-way uh, conversation, right? Where never before, whether it's a celebrity like Matt Damon or Rain Wilson or a Ben Stiller or Sarah, Sarah Silverman or any of these, I think, um, A-list celebrities who are out front ahead of the curve doing it, um, it is a way to communicate with their fans directly and share it in a different platform. And, uh, you know, when you're looking at a movie screen, you're watching TV, it's, it's static, it's one way, right? And it's, you know versus the conversation we can have in, in real life or in real time now. Yeah. And All I think right. that's what the most successful channels do. They start a conversation. You know, they're the fodder for a conversation. Either they're yeah. commenters or sharing it on, through social media or your friends via email. And that's the thing that I think is amazing. And if you're in traditional media, you know, we look at um, people like Ellen DeGeneres and Jimmy Kimmel as kind of great examples of partners who are on YouTube, they have great YouTube channels, and are using the platform to extend the conversation around their more traditional media presence. Yeah. That's an interesting point. Let's talk a little bit about that, too, because there are some who are just repurposing content that was shot for a certain screen and putting it on YouTube. How do you feel about that versus designing something custom for the YouTube experience? Let's talk about that a little bit. Well, I think the platform works for both. You know, it's designed to both be a great, it's the best video platform. It's designed to deliver video in the best way possible in as many ways possible. You also can look at, you know, the, the David Letterman on YouTube on the CBS channel is also a really great experience. You know, it's a different experience, but they, they do really well as well. 
You know, I think it really depends on what your goals are for the story and the show you're trying to create. You know, and I mean, this is obvious, but David Letterman or Ellen or Jimmy does well because they're on broadcast. They've already got an audience and they're just porting them over to YouTube. But let's talk about some of the people who are starting from scratch. Give us some tips and secrets that no one else knows that's not on the playbook that partners and creators can do to really build their community because that's what they want. They want subs and views. And I think really the only reason they want that is for social proof um, so that they can begin to build this following so that they can then leverage that into bigger numbers. But what are your thoughts? I think Liam and I talk a lot about this, um, about the idea of being authentic and how important it is to building a YouTube channel. You know, you, you can't really fake it on YouTube. You have to be yeah. truly, um, you have to be really true to your vision and really engaging about it and don't try to be too artificial. Um, the other advice I frequently give people. Okay, wait a second. So you say artificial. So uh, let's define that a little bit more because if I look at someone like Jenna, for example, or even Justine or Phil DeFranco or any of these guys, they are big personalities. Yeah. And and I know a couple of them, and they are exactly like that in real life. But some of them are putting on a show. It's a so. different. It's a different. Um, I think it, the thing is that it's a very personal voice. Is it giving you even audience? if it's it's it being in a conversation with them? Again, it okay. comes back to that idea of conversation. Is it giving your audience what they want or what you think that they want? Is that the key? You're if you're not interested in it yourself, yeah. you're just guessing, you yeah. know, and you're just putting stabs in the dark. Yeah. Whereas if you are actually engaged with it yourself, then people are going to see that and they're going to be excited about that. You know, you don't want someone just paying lip service. It's, it's like at a party. You don't want someone to just be giving you lip service at a party. You want yeah. them actually telling you their opinions and feelings. Yeah, you can't fake it till you yeah. make it. In this. And yes, there is a more sometimes presentational style of doing that, just like how some people at parties are like party animals and really intense about it. There's also yeah. people who are a little more low-key about it. Yeah. And I think there are different ways to be authentic on the platform. But um, so if I'm you're just chasing views... Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a hard race if you aren't passionate about it. That's the biggest point. I agree. So authenticity is a great point. What else? Well, I would say one of the best pieces of advice I've heard from a YouTuber is that uh, not, to, not to overthink it, not to uh, be too precious about the first video that you upload, um, and to think about, you know, one of the rules that Seth Godin probably told you when you met Seth was that... Uh, Publish, publish, publish is you know an important rule on the web, and mm -hmm. it goes for web video too. I think that uh, what I, my advice to folks who are starting a channel is don't shoot 20 episodes of something and put it in the can before you even know what your audience thinks. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, you will uh, understanding if you're being authentic. If you're not sure if you're being authentic, the audience will help you figure that out. Yeah. So. Um, Fail fast, uh, yeah. motto that we love to chant in okay. the building here. There's never been more content on YouTube. Do we know any stats, like how much content is being uploaded every day, exactly. roughly? 72 hours a minute are uploaded every day to YouTube. So, and billions of views. Um, and the barrier to entry to production has never been easier. So we all have some sort of smartphone that shoots 1080p. So what do you say to the person that says, okay, great, I get that video up there for, you know, even if it's fantastic, I put it up there and it's just in the sea of noise. How do I get noticed? How do I start from ground zero and build that community? So authenticity is important. Failing fast is important. What else you got? Before you even start rolling on the camera, think about how people are going to discover it and why they would share it. So what, how does this already engage in a conversation online? You know, how are you already connecting to someone and so you're talking, talking about, about something interesting? So it's, it's yes, it's search, but it's also yeah. social. So you're talking about picking your audience before yeah. you go out. And sometimes you might have to do that a few times, like Liam was saying, 10 or 15 videos. You know, the example I think he and I cite a lot is Annoying Orange, who um, Dane has a really successful Annoying Orange channel. Yeah, and it lives up to its name. It's amazing. Great. It's amazing. <laughs> but if you look at his personal channel where he kind of developed that character. Yeah. He has, I think, almost a hundred variations, not even on an annoying orange, but all these other animations and ideas he did to get to that point, yeah. to find the thing. And each time he was thinking about 
how it was going to be ser searched for, and how it was going to be shared. Uh, what would you say to someone who says, you know, the, the early adopters, people like Justine who were on in 2005, I think maybe is when she started, when there wasn't all that noise, built that great momentum and, you know, built it to what it is today. How do you respond to someone who wants to start today with a channel versus someone who started so early? I mean, is it, is it as easy? Is this the best time or the worst time to start? Uh, well, that's kind of a paradox, I think. You know, on, on the one hand, it's easier because there is a playbook out there. There are best practices in terms of building an audience. People are looking for good video on the web. And on the other hand, it's a more crowded market. I think that um, I haven't asked Justine what, her, what was in her mind when she launched her channel. But I, another piece of advice that I give folks who really are serious about launching a channel is it it is an investment of your time. You know, the first few videos you upload are, no matter how good they are, the chances that they're gonna be explosive hits is not high. It really is a long game and you yeah. have to have a, what's your three month plan, what's your six month plan. You don't have to know what every video is gonna be, but you have to be thinking in terms of you're building a property over time and it takes an, an investment. Yeah, so that's good advice. Maybe an editorial calendar, some sort of plan with sure. markers like, because it seems like one of the things that all these creators are doing is they have, um, it's like Pavlov's dog, they're uh, training their audience when to come back. Okay, we have a new show every week, every month, every day, every hour, whatever it is. And so that's You can find me here when I'm not uploading a video. That seems to be another key component. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that, I mean, the Fine Brothers are just so smart about they're building audiences on the web and one of the, they use the term transmedia, but My Music, the series that they're in production on right now has several characters, all of the characters, each one has its own Tumblr, each one has its own Twitter, each one has its own Facebook, and if you, um, if you are uh, looking for those characters when, you know, they're not shooting video or you've watched all the video, you can always get more. Yeah. And have a dialogue with them. Mm -hmm. So that's a great point. So to the extent that you can drive, because it's sort of counterintuitive to drive people away from your channel, but what you're saying is to extend to different platforms that people may have may also be. It's like if you're a hungry lion, you want to go where the zebras are. So if they're on Tumblr, send them to Tumblr or Twitter. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and you'll get you go back and forth. You know? Yeah. And also, I think with um, Google Plus, people are finding audiences on there and. You know, there you you have to go where your audience is, and that also means, you know, like you are going to the partnering with the right blogs or doing blog outreach or, you know, developing uh, relationships with other creators, consistently going back to people to find the audience wherever it is. This last year, there was this launch of the premium channel, or premium channels, right, where uh, a number of creators were selected to do premium content. Let's talk a little bit about that and how that's going, in your opinion, and and then let's talk about um, YouTube as a as a business model, you know, monetiz monetization strategy and how that's working, and maybe give folks um, an idea of some other options about how to monetize their channel. So let's talk about premium channels first. How's that going? I mean, the first purpose I think of that project was to catalyze a different kind of content potentially or catalyze creators that hadn't considered the platform to do so or to do so in a more ambitious way. Yeah. And I think we're very happy with uh, the results there. You've seen some really interesting programming coming out of that. So I almost feel like um, these A-list celebrities either from movies or TV doing something on the web, whether it's a web series or whatnot, it's almost kind of like doing their, what it used to be like to do an indie film. Like it's kind of cool again, to, you know, back to basics, back to the drawing board, sharpen the saw, whatever it is. Do you get that sense, like that's what's happening? There's like this groundswell with uh, some of the Hollywood talent coming over to the web? Well, I think there's a lot of creative freedom and that's really fun. Yeah. You know, people go where they can be creative and YouTube's a great place for that at all levels. And we have crowdfunding platforms now that are making it possible for no names and big names. There's a lot of controversy right now, right? On on Kickstarter about it being unfair. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, well, Kickstarter is a platform like YouTube. You know, people are going to use it. All kinds of people are going to use it. Uh, and it's a new space. You're going to see people use different ways. 
it seems like the difference is that Kickstarter is a great way to get your existing audience to do something, whereas YouTube is a place to build a community. You know, Kickstarter is not good for building a community per se from scratch. It's really difficult with everything that's happening versus, I mean, here, this, you know, your first video is really the beginning to building your audience, no? I guess that's right. It's, I, I, I won't say I'm an expert on Kickstarter, except that I know that it's a place where YouTubers can and other creative people can raise money. Yeah. Um, but certainly what you say about YouTube is true, that you can start with nothing and, and build an audience. Yeah. It's a platform where that's entirely possible. The other, just to address your comment about indie films and A-list stars doing them, I think one distinction I would draw is, maybe this is occasionally true in the indie film world, but this, is, this can be a real business. And so you have Brian Robbins, um, you know, moving to web video and creating a company that, uh, you know, has is worth tens of millions of dollars in a relatively short amount of time. And that's a that's a great story. It's taken others longer to build their businesses, but it's but it, it's a real. You, you can make a business justification for doing it in addition to the creative justification, which is one of the things that I think makes it really exciting. Yeah, How have you seen long form evolve? Because it used to be you know, that golden marker, just under three minutes. And to me, that's completely, you know, history. That's very 2005 or six. Now we're seeing long form, um, 10, 15, 30, an hour. Thoughts on that? Well, I mean, as someone who was on YouTube as an independent creator in 2005, 2006, uploading 15, 20 minute long episodes and actually doing pretty well at it, I think that the, the short form thing was it's a, I feel like it's a misnomer. I think people are going to watch as much as they want to watch as long as it's engaging. And I think we're seeing yeah. that across the platform. People are watching more and more videos, longer videos, and that's exciting. I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, it's a, again, it's a platform for everyone. It's the, for all kinds of video, and it can be long or short. I think as long as it's engaging and interesting, people are going to watch it. Yeah, I, well, I feel the same way. I'm biased, of course. But I feel like, you know, now that we've got the content and we have so many places to watch it. I mean, we're taking our tablets into our room or we're traveling with it to watch the content. We're literally taking the content with us. But also, if we're sitting on the couch, we've got a larger screen, it won't be too far that we just you know, zip it up there and we can watch that content. I think you can already do that. That's right. With an Android phone. But you know, no, <laughs> but, but that's not the mainstream, right? That, that's like the, the very small percent of the world. And, and maybe that's why when I talk to friends uh, or get, you know, opinions about who's watching YouTube uh, the most, it's younger people, right? It's not, it's not the mainstream yet who are still conditioned to watch TV or go to movies. They don't go to the Internet first yet, but it's coming. I think it's a big group of people today that do it. You know, it's obviously not the entire globe, but... Um we like to talk about the audience on YouTube as we refer to them as Generation C. They're connected, they're yeah. curators, they're creators in addition to consumers. Um, and that's a big group of people and um, a maturing group of people. I agree. We've been spending a little time with Liam and Kathleen here at YouTube Space LA. Thanks so much for being on the show, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Work. Great job. This Behind the Brand episode is brought to you by DocuSign global standard for e-signature. Get your free trial at DocuSign.com forward slash behind the brand.